So on behalf of Control Arms, I really wish to welcome everyone to this online discussion on corporate responsibility, human rights, and the arms industry, coming together or forever remaining apart. My name is Hinaway Luce, and I am the Control Arms representative based in Geneva. You know, many of you I am listening in today will be, you know, might be familiar with the work of Control Arms. Uh, we work to strengthen the norms governing the international trade in conventional arms. Essentially, our objective is to reduce human suffering as a result of a poorly regulated arms trade. The achievement of that objective is dependent on states establishing robust uh, regulatory frameworks, but also on the engagement and actions of the arms industry, an industry that has been implicated in conflict atrocities and all too often operates under a veil of secrecy. During today's discussion, we are going to address some of the challenges um, in relation to the arms industry, whether or not corporate responsibility, human rights and other instruments of international law are changing the behaviour of this industry and what are the pro uh, prospects for um, bringing about a more responsible arms industry in the future. How this discussion today is going to be conducted is that we're going to have three um, rounds of questions to our experts and um, responses will be limited to five minutes. And, you know, unlike the arms industry, there will be um, some transparency and accountability here and uh, you know, people will be cut off. Uh, there will be follow-up questions, and certainly the audience are um, members of the audience are encouraged to ask questions. At um, the end, we're very fortunate to be joined by Miss Rachel Stoll, who uh, who will be a familiar figure to many of you. Rachel is the vice president of the Stimson Centre, and she will make concluding comments and talk about her experiences of engaging the arms industry. But I'm really delighted to be um, joined by a distinguished uh, lineup of experts. So without further introduction, I, I want to get underway. And, uh, you know, first, First up is Mr. Andrew Feinstein, Executive Director of Shadow World Investigations. Andrew was a former member of parliament in South Africa during the 1990s when an arms deal worth approximately 10 billion US dollars and one that was championed by former South African president Mabeki was carried out. And this, this agreement um, came about at a time when South Africa was in the midst of the HIV AIDS crisis and desperately needed investment in its health system. Not only has, this, um, has that arms deal been criticised for, uh, for the amount of money that was involved, but also due to allegations of corruption. Understandably, Andrew has been an ardent critic of the arms industry. Andrew, my question to you is that indices on the most corrupt um, industries globally often cite the extractives industries. Those are mining, oil and gas as being the most problematic. Uh, the reality, you know, the reality is, is that uh, corruption and a lack of transparency is a feature of a number of industries. How and why is it that you see the arms industry as being such a problem with particular reference to its relationship to corruption? Over to you, Andrew. Sorry, you'd think after almost three years we would have got used to unmuting, but I still forget. Um, thanks so much for the question and also for the invitation. So, very interestingly, um, a guy by the name of Joe Rober, who had been an intermediary in the oil industry, so in extractives for many years, took early retirement because he'd made huge amounts of money and actually started working with Transparency International, looking at the corruption of the extractives industry. And what he first dis discovered 
was that in fact he believed there was more corruption in the arms trade and that the two were often very closely tied together. So the most corrupt commercial transaction in history, the Al Yamama arms deal between Britain and Saudi Arabia, in which six billion pounds of bribes were paid. Much of the payment was made by Saudi Arabia in oil, which enabled the protagonists to over or under invoice as they needed to, in order to facilitate the flow and laundering of the corrupt monies. So Joe put, uh, due to access to intelligence agencies, treasuries around the world, suggested that the arms trade was um, responsible for around 40% of all corruption in all global trade. Now, why is this the case? I mean, to put it incredibly simply, here you have an industry that's worth on average about $400 billion a year. Um, that obviously varies quite a lot, but let, let's put that as the average. So you have sort of a few transactions every year that are worth tens of billions of dollars that are very important politically, economically, and obviously to the commercial viability of the, country, of the companies involved. Then, as you suggested, you have this veil of national security imposed secrecy that covers pretty much everything to do with arms deals in most countries of the world. So, you know, in my 20 odd years of researching this, we must have put in, I don't know, probably now 14, 15,000 freedom of information requests around the world. And 99 point, probably six or seven percent of them, we just get the response. This is a matter of national security. Um, we can't divulge that information. So you have the huge amounts of money, the secrecy, and you have incredibly close relationships between these companies and the states, some of which are state-owned, many of which are private, but still have incredibly close relationships to their states. And this creates an absolutely fertile environment um, for corruption. And that's certainly been my experience in the 20 odd years I've been researching the subject. And my book, The Shadow World Inside the Global Arms Trade, deals with just a, the tip of the iceberg of these cases. There are literally thousands of them. The other factor is also due to national security and the closeness to governments. Much of what happens in the arms trade happens with virtual legal impunity. So I calculated by the end of 2011, there'd been 502 violations of UN arms embargoes. Only two of them had ever led to any form of legal accountability. One to a prosecution and the arms dealer who was prosecuted took great delight in telling me when I interviewed him that the fine he was given wasn't even pocket change for him by comparison to the $158 million profit he'd made on the deal in which he had violated two um, arms embargoes at the same time. So it's something of a free for all when it comes to corruption. And the final thing I want to say on this very conscious of my time is that to understand this corruption and why nothing more is done about it, we have to understand the relationship between the significant amounts of bribes, what are sometimes technically called commissions, on some of these arms deals and party political financing. In the United States, it's a sort of an above board reality that we can trace in a system of what, and I'm trying to think who it was, it was probably Bill Harting um, or, or one of the Pentagon whistleblowers who described it as a, as a case of legalized bribery. In Europe, where there is even more corruption than in the US because the US has um, economies of scale advantages over EU manufacturers who use corruption much more to get their deals through. In the EU, it's actually illegal and in the UK, but happens probably more commonly than in the United States. So the use of a lot of these monies, like was the case with my own party, the ANC in South Africa, to actually fund political activity and election campaigns is hugely important in understanding the economics underpinning the corruption of the global arms trade. Yeah, thanks very much, Andrew. But just one issue that I, I want to ask you about, and that is when, um, you know, I, I've read your work and, and listening to you now, um, it, you know, is it an issue of the behaviour of the arms industry or is it an issue about good governance and, um, you know, better security sector governance? 
if you know if the arms deal that um, was struck in in South Africa during the 1990s had 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 been really the subject of parliamentary scrutiny and some debate, you know, at the very least, I, I would have hoped that the amount of money involved would have been reduced. But you know, I, but the points you raise now about the closeness between arms. Um, uh, between arms companies and their governments. And there, there, is, there is a problem here that often for arms companies, their, their national government is their best customer. Um, th this, this makes for a, a, a compromised regulatory environment. Like what if you were if you had to put your investment in, in somewhere, would you put it on changing the behavior of the arms industry or on um, better governance? You're muted, you're muted again. You can't do one without the other. Um, the reality is because of that closeness, um, improving governance in the state sector without improving corporate governance, you're still going to have a problem. I mean, the reality is in any corrupt transaction, you require at least two parties, usually a third party as well, the intermediaries who effectively launder the money so that it's incredibly difficult to trace back. Um, and so that there's legal distance between the state and the corruption and the individuals receiving the money. So I, I think you, you absolutely cannot separate the two. You know, in the South African context, I had chaired the committee that drafted South Africa's post-1994 public sector financial management infrastructure. I drafted all of that legislation. And sadly, I was in parliament as the ranking ANC member on the main financial, financial oversight committee to watch that legislation effectively getting stomped all over by my own party. And it's only got worse. The arms deal that we experienced that you mentioned, 10 billion conservative estimate of $350 million of bribes. It's how we fought our second general election campaign in 1999 within the ANC. And as you said, this was at the time that Thabo Mbeki was telling the 6 million South Africans living with HIV or AIDS that we couldn't afford to provide them with life-saving antiretroviral medication, leaving to over 365,000 deaths in the next five years, avoidable deaths, 32,000 babies born HIV positive a year in each of those five years according to the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. The key is that we have to clean up governance both in, in the state and in corporations. At the time that the South African deal was taking place, BAE Systems, the British company for whom Tony Blair had made at least three trips to South Africa as their marketer in chief to sell this deal, they were paying 115 million pounds of bribes to win one contract on the South African deal. At the same time, they were paying similar bribes on seven or eight other deals around the world. Now, you couldn't resolve that situation of the corruption between the British state and BAE systems without improving governance in both. And, you know, the reality is that partnership was probably paying over a billion pounds in bribes around the world. So the only solutions that I see are solutions that address governance in both those locations. And the key thing is really to differentiate between what should necessarily for secure, national security and defense purposes remain secret and what should be transparent and accountable. Because criminal activity clearly should not be kept secret for reasons of national security and defense. And that applies across both the state and the corporate sectors. Now, th thanks very much, Andrew. And I think that's a really good message that, uh, you know, it's key to clean up governance in both the state and, and these corporations. And now let's next move on to Ms. Susie Snyder, um, who approaches the arms industry from a different angle, and that is the financing of this industry. At, um, as the financial sector coordinator of ICANN, the international campaign against nuclear weapons, Susie has both extensively researched and spoken on the financing of nuclear weapons, but also the weapons industry in general. Um, Susie, at a time when the global economy is struggling with the impact of COVID, there are growing fears of inflation. Um, the development gains of the past 10 to 20 years are at risk of being lost. 
Uh, nevertheless, investment in and spending on arms remains strong. Uh, why is the arms trade an area of investment by both governments and the private sector that is strong both in times of economic growth, but in also in times of economic downturn? Over to you, Susie. Well, thanks so much. And it's great to be here and, and with this group and talking about this really important subject. Um, I think it needs more attention than maybe people think. Um, and overall, building on what Andrew was talking about, there's, there's a cycle of complicity here, right? So the business of defense companies is war. It's conflict. It's armed strife. That's their business model. They need it to make money. Their investors need them to make money to get returns. And they need to diversify their business model. And I do want to note some defense companies are starting to diversify and take on other, uh, other activities, but not nearly enough. Um, and in the meantime, there is a lot of money spent to get these contracts. And it's like Andrew was saying, and, you know, it's, it's the, there's the corruption side um, that is in secret, but then there's the very public, very traceable lobbying side as well. And we did a report last year looking just at nuclear weapon contractors, um, and we found more than 100 million spent in 2020 on lobbying in the United States just by a handful of contractors, right? And that's public record. They hired people to go in and lobby. Um, and that does not include the money they spent in campaign contributions. And William Hartung uh, tracked that back to 31 million was spent by the defense sector in 2020 on campaign contributions, just in the US. That's a lot of money. Um, and I'd be really interested to know, and I haven't yet found it, maybe, maybe somebody here knows, um, to, to also see how the lobbying by foreign governments, where that is tied in as well, because there's also lobbying done by other governments to secure arms export licenses um, to enable more of these defense contracts to go through. And that's not on the ticket of the defense contractors. So that's a, that's a, a question I have that's, that's out there. But there's, there's, you know, anecdotally, we know there's a lot of money going in that direction as well. And these lobbyists, they're not reporting on lobbying on, on export, arms export licenses. They're not reporting on their lobbying efforts around new defense contracts. What they're lobbying on is COVID relief for their workers, um, preventing new regulations around transparency, around um, Securities and Exchange Commission reporting. They want to keep things in the dark. It's useful. Um, and it's very beneficial for these contractors, for, this, this, for the defense sector. So BAE Systems already came up. I'm not going to be shy in naming names. Um, it's the benefit of, of being in the NGO sector sometimes. So BAE Systems, for every dollar they spent lobbying in the year in the U.S. in 2000, or two, excuse me, in 2020, they got $2,000 back in contract money. That's a huge return on investment for them. And it's probably why their CEO took home eight and a half million dollars himself that year, which is a pretty high salary in the UK. Um, and a lot of these contracts, they are, they're multi-year contracts. So again, BAE only got, uh, only, um, only got 20 billion in contracts in, in 2020, but they had two and a half times that in their backlog. So for investors, it's like, oh, well, you know, they've got long-term contracts. They're not likely to break those contracts and it delivers cash back to shareholders. Um, somebody once said to me that, you know, you know we've all heard it, um, that the certainties of life are death and taxes. And when I look at what the arms companies are doing, they're using tax money that they're getting through these contracts to sell death over and over. And they're taking it in on all sides. And they're not shy about it. And this is what's mind boggling, right? They are not quiet, not shy. Um, and we see it in the transcripts of what the arms manufacturers or the shareholder calls. They're thinking about how are they going to leverage conflict to sell more weapons? So recently, Greg Hayes, who's the chairman and CEO of Raytheon, he talked about drone attack in the UAE, tensions in Eastern Europe, tensions in the South China Sea. And he said, and I quote, all of those things are putting pressure on some of the defense spending over there. So I fully expect we're going to see some benefit from it. 
Now, he may not have said that in the same tone of voice that I have, <laughs> um, but it's, it's very clear that they are looking for and not shy about encouraging this kind of activity. And this is only, I mean, I'm only talking here about the companies that are profiting from weapons supply. There are other companies that are profiting throughout kind of a, a war economy through whether it be logistics provision, reconstruction costs, sometimes the same companies. Some of them, they're diversifying into reconstruction costs so they can bomb it and then clean it up and take on both sides. Um, and of course, private security contracting. Um, now, it's, it continues to happen. And I think, you know, Andrew's right, we need to look at multiple ways to address this issue. Um, and there are some changes taking place. Um, it's not no longer investors looking that uh, investing with impunity. Um, you know, there there's starting to be there's starting to be a cost to this kind of activity. But I'll I'll hold that. Okay. Um, hey, thanks, you. Susie. That that could maybe come for the next round. You know, I um, it, it's interesting. You know, listening to you talk about you know, just the money that's involved in, in winning contracts and the lobbying that goes on around these different companies. I, I can't help but think that, in fact, this, this has got the potential to get worse. When I think about, um, you know, that there's a lot of research going into um, developing new weapons. You know, like we talk about death and taxes being the certainties of life. We should also talk about, um, you know, weapons technology will continue to improve because it, it, it seems to be a, you know, another certainty. Uh, you know, high-tech weapons, the focus is on um, autonomy and weapon systems and the advantages that that could bring about. So the companies who make this breakthrough on more high-tech weapons just imagine the lobbying and, and the queuing up that will go on to um, purchase their weapons Susie is this the case that um, come you know that they're the lobbying around companies that are selling high-tech weapons or even just researching them is far more intense than others well see it's very difficult I, I have to say for me it's difficult to, to see because all of the major defense contractors are putting a lot of energy into researching and developing high-tech weapons and there's a revolving door um, you look at the former CEO of of Raytheon who's now sitting um, in the US Defense Department very high up in the US Defense Department there's there's a revolving door in the contracts and so who makes decisions about developing new types of systems? It's like the same cluster of, of 25 guys, it seems. Um, and that's a, that's a real issue um, that, we, that we can and I think are starting to address. Yeah, yeah, thanks very much. Well, moving along to our, our third speaker, and this takes, an, you know, uh, our third speaker represents um, an, another approach to the arms industry, really a, a very direct approach, and that is legal action against um, gun companies. Um, last year, the government of Mexico filed a case against 10 gun companies in the state of uh, Massachusetts in the United States for selling arms to gun dealers um, in the knowledge that these would be sold on to the drug cartels in Mexico. There has recently uh, been a wave of litigation cases against the decisions by governments to grant export licenses and Control Arms is closely following these cases. However, Mexico's case is very different in that it ad directly addresses the arms industry and it is concerned with domestic sales. And though I should note in the submission that's been filed by the government to Mexico, it is clear that this case is not about the second amendment right to bear arms. Uh, to talk about this case, we are really fortunate to be joined by Mexico's legal consultant, uh, Mr. Alejandro uh, Chilerio, and I, I hope, really hope I've um, pronounced your name correctly, but I will further attempt to ingratiate myself by congratulating Mexico on winning the 2021 Arms Control Person of the Year. And it's really for the courage, I think that's um, acknowledgement for the courage in bringing forward this case. 
Alejandro, I think it would be beneficial for our audience to learn more about the back, you know, about the reasoning and the, about the background to the case. Um, you know, for example, why has the government of Mexico um, chosen to take legal action against hen gum, gun companies rather than pursuing this issue in dialogue with the United States government? And really, what, what are the key arguments um, in your case against the gun companies? Um, thank you very much. I feel so privileged to be um... I'm in charge of a great group of litigators here in, in, in the foreign ministry, and it's a great privilege to be talking with you all and with this audience. Uh, for the longest time, we've been working the government of Mexico to stem the flow of illicit guns coming, mainly, if not the majority, 70% of guns buying illicitly in Mexico come from the United States. And our work... Uh, yesterday, we found in our archives that uh, there's me uh, uh, memories from 1911 of the Mexican government talking with the U.S. about how we, we could stop gun trafficking. So from then, in the last years, we've been working with the U.S. government to try to strengthen our capacities to seize guns coming into Mexico. And our efforts have gone to the multilateral fora, multilateral uh, Air Force, law enforcement, coordination, and so forth. But there's a missing link always in the conversation. What about the companies, private corporations? They are, they know, they are aware where their products end, not only because of uh, what is in the media, sadly, uh, their books, governmental reports, your own work in, in control arms about what these companies are doing. There's information, uh, traceability information based on the serial number, even if the serial number is obliterated, there's the chance to find um, uh, the, the route and find out where did certain uh, gun came uh, from. The latest information from the, the agency in charge of, of this topic in the US, the ATF, Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, says that around 70% uh, of the guns found in Mexico illicitly come from the United States and less than 3% of the, the guns found in Mexico come from legal exports from the US, meaning that less than 3% come from purchases from uh, the Mexican government to American companies. Why is it that we resorted on, on litigation? Um, we are deploying all our actions uh, diplomatic action, governmental action, civil society. And this is just another action in addition to what we're doing to hold these companies accountable. What is that we're doing? We're suing them for um, negligence, negligent actions and illicit actions that actively facilitate uh, the illicit traffic of their weapons. For the longest time, the narrative has been that these guns that uh, um, are used in Mexico by criminals or uh, to um, incur in, in violations of human rights are because are lost by the, the, the Mexican government or come from somewhere else, or even if they're uh, spontaneously appear in Mexico. Nothing has been told from about the uh, responsibility of these companies in facilitating the illicit traffic by allowing straw purchasers to, to buy uh, military style weapons the way they market military style weapons in the US. Uh, the, these companies know that in Mexico, there's only one office that issues permits to private citizens to get a gun. This office managed by the, the Mexican army has a very restricted caliber um, uh, authorization for people. So a, a Barrett caliber 50 cannot be acquired legally in Mexico by a private citizen. So. These companies know and allow their products to be sold and allow their products to be trafficked to Mexico and used to cause harm. It was important in our relationship with the United States that every time gets, every day gets stronger and stronger in how we work to look into the corporate responsibility. Uh, Mexican Secretary of, of uh, Foreign Affairs, uh, Marcel Ebrard, was before the Security Council and 
Some people might have thought that it was out of the box to talk about companies in a small and light weapons discussion. But what we did, and it was necessary to say it, is let's work together, the, the states, the countries, governments, to encourage our private citizens and corporations to self-regulate, to impose, how to impose policies. And if they have all this technology to build these modern arms, why not imposing or uh, designing their weapons in a way to avert the illicit traffic and illicit use of their weapons by, by private citizens? Let me end this by saying, for the longest time, the conversation has been about um, diversion of weapons. It is important to discuss about that. It's important to talk about the wholesale of weapons and, and ammunitions, and little is talk about the retail sale of weapons and the illicit traffic of those guns sale in, uh, sold in retail. So that's why it's so important to uh, this litigation, not only for the purpose of holding uh, the companies accountable, but also to engage with organizations like Control Arms and others to talk about, we're talking about the same companies. And we're talking about companies that not only benefit, by a lot, benefit economically by allowing the illicit traffic of um, their weapons, but also by selling, in the case of Mexico and other governments of the region, weaponry to the armed forces to respond to the firepower that criminal organizations have. So at the end, the gun companies win and win. Nobody loses, but um, in, in terms of gun manufacturers, they don't lose by provoking the problem and then offering the solution. And the violence spiral that we're living in Mexico and in the region has to stop. And these companies has a key to have the key to stop this by implementing protocols and imposing measures in the distribution chain to avert the illicit traffic of their products. Half a million of weapons a year, that's a lot of weapons in Mexico that shouldn't be. And that's why we're having the situation we're having and that's why we're suing. Thanks very much, Alejandro. And um, I, I actually read the go uh, government of Mexico submission, and I must say, it makes um, it makes for a, a, you know very, really sobering reading that there has been a long uh, a long history of efforts undertaken and to no avail. Uh, you know, your your case really is being closely watched. And so you've, um, you've filed a submission from your side. The defendants have responded. What is the timeline? You, I understand that you will file a response to the defendants as to why the case should be heard and why it shouldn't be thrown out. And then the court comes to a decision as to whether this case will be heard. So for these next two steps, what is the timeline? Um, uh, certainly, the, our reply to the, the defense of the defendants will be submitted on Monday the 31st in a couple of days from now. Okay. After that, on January 28th, the defendants have until January 28th to file a, a counter reply for the last reply to our uh, responses. Um, after that, we're expecting the, the judge in Boston, Massachusetts to schedule a hearing so we can present our, our arguments. Now, if I may, in, in two minutes, explain the in general, the, the companies, of course, the, the response has a lot of elements saying, it's not my fault, it's your fault. And that's been the narrative for a lot of years. You're corrupt. You don't know how to control your borders. It's your fault. It's your army. It's fine. Those are not legal arguments. On the legal arguments in terms of personal jurisdiction, they're saying, I have nothing to do with what happened to Mexico. I have no responsibility, no duty to what happens in Mexico in terms of harm. Well, our response will um, uh, reiterate what we said in our lawsuit. They're companies, they're businesses. They have a duty to uh, make products that are safe. They have a duty to um, avoid any harm made by their um, product. And their products are weapons that hurt, kill, and damage. Um, that's one. And the other one that it, it'll be quite interesting is uh, we're talking about lobbying and, and other elements. Um, I'm a career diplomat and government official, so I'm very careful with my words. Lobbying and reach of the companies. 
they enjoy of a statute that provides certain immunities against uh, civil liability in the United States for harm occur, and that's our argument, harm caused in U.S. territory, not in Mexican territory. So we're facing not only a very powerful um, industry, uh, but they also enjoy, and I believe it's one of the only industries and only in, in certain, in, in one country in the U.S., a statute that provides certain immunity. So the legal discussion will be around if they enjoy immunity or they don't. So stay tuned to this. Thank you for the interest. Yeah, it is. It will be interesting. Thanks very much. And so I, I just want to speak briefly on this issue of litigation because this whole area of uh, corporate responsibility, human rights and business, this is an area of, inter of international law and law at the national levels that is really still under development. Practice is, is still being developed um, this is an area of international law that still has a long way to go in terms of being strengthened. Litigation is important because it really tests where is the law at this moment. And the outcomes of litigation um, can, be, can be important for uh, determining the future direction of how law will be developed and also for policy development. So th this is one of the reasons why in this discussion, we've really picked up on this role of, um, of litigation. And another case that was mentioned in the invitation to this event, and it's also a, 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 an important case that's been closely watched. And that is the one that was um, initiated by the European Centre for Constitutional and Human Rights and other partners that was submitted to the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, making a request for the court to investigate European governments and arms company officials for potentially aiding and abetting war crimes in Yemen. So the, the outcomes of this case will also be interesting and will also um, inform us as to where the law is at on, on these matters. Over the past 15 years, there have been a lot of developments in the area of corporate responsibility and human rights. We have the UN guiding principles on human rights and, uh, and business, otherwise known as the RUGI principles. And these were adopted by consensus in the United Nations. We also have a, a treaty that is being slowly negotiated, and that is a treaty on business and human rights. And, you know, just an example of how some corporations are changing their behaviour is that now uh, Coca-Cola, which I'm not in any way suggesting is comparable to the arms industry, uh, produces a human rights report. And 15 years ago, it was simply unimaginable that companies somehow had an obligation to respect and to demonstrate that they were um, respecting human rights. So this is an area that is moving. But our question today is, has it had an impact on the arms industry? So I want to go back to you again, Alejandro, and um, you know, you you refer to this, um, and, and I also was very intrigued by this. That the defendants at one point in their response cast this as this case as a clash of cultural values, where the US recognizes a right to bear arms, and Mexico has a tightly regulated the sale and ownership of guns. And as you say, this is not a legal argument. Um, you know, in your case. Do you think there is scope for further strengthening um, your arguments by reference to uh, international human rights standards and other instruments of international law? Um, thank you very much. Uh, let me start by saying that these um, companies have been sued so many times that we are aware how they respond and how they want to take the narrative or where they want to take it. So yeah, certainly, um, we could use more arguments in terms of uh, human rights and international standards. 
we didn't do it in our original complaint and we're not going to do it in our reply in terms of before the court because our case at the end is a tort law case. It's a transboundary tort law. It's very basic. The defendants did or did not something that is causing us harm as plaintiffs. And we want to keep it that way in uh, before the court. Otherwise, the conversation is going to be well, Mexico violates human rights, and it's actually the army that is doing things, and it's corrupt, and then the conversation is going to go away, and the defendants, and the industry in the United States, the, the gun manufacturers, will benefit from distracting from the main issue that is, you know, what is happening in Mexico, and I think that's looking at the, at the guiding principles and saying, uh, perhaps not yet, but it will happen. The, the fact that they could foresee violations of human rights, the effects of their actions and inactions, they can foresee it in this day and age. Organized crime in Mexico showed with a lot of uh, exposure, the kind of guns that they're using, the series of the platforms online, they are unnoticed. So if they can foresee that their guns can cause harm, they can violate human rights, perhaps they can change their uh, practices. Now, an additional and um, brief comment. There's a whole mechanism and uh, some countries resort on them when their senates and their congress looked at, uh, in the case of Mexico, saying you shouldn't buy these weapons because there's allegations of violation of human rights. Well, perhaps the same intensity in terms of, the, uh, of looking at what could happen with a product could be used for the retail sale of products. There's already a route that could be used in terms of looking at the final user, final use, and foreseeability of possible violations of human rights and damage that could be caused. So I think we're on the right path. And in terms of out of the litigation, in terms of narrative, we should talk more about there's already good practices, businesses. If you're saying that your cultural value is to do good business and avoid harm, let's work together. If you say that your cultural value is to sell to whomever, regardless of the harm that can cast, then there's a clash because Mexico doesn't believe in that and you, they should be accountable. So I think there's a lot of room out of the litigation to talk about this. Yeah, yeah, thanks very much. Okay, back to you, back to you, Andrew. I, uh, Andrew, I'd be really interested in your views as to whether you think, uh, you know, with with the stre uh, strengthening narrative around uh, corporate responsibility, with more focus on human rights, is the behaviour of the arms industry changing? You know, one thing that I find difficult um, when considering the arms industry and corporate responsibility is that, you know, I, I as a, a regular consumer, you know, I'm concerned about... Um, you know, not wearing products that are, that are the result of uh, child labour. But with the, with the arms industry, it's really, you know, focused on the end use. And so it's, it's difficult to imagine um, that, that they are really feeling um, the pressure of um, in, uh, an increased emphasis on corporate responsibility. But, you know, what are, what are your views and what, what have you witnessed so far? I think what we've seen over the years um, is that what the sort of the increased emphasis on corporate responsibility on human rights has done, in our opinion, is it's improved the public relations of the weapons makers. They've become far more astute and far slicker at selling themselves and what they do rather than actually changing their behaviors. Um, it's difficult for me to talk about current investigations um, until those are published with all of the documentary evidence, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, there's one company that we've been investigating for years, and this is for a combination of illegal criminal corruption and also what we regard as illegal arms sales that have huge human rights consequences. And the extraordinary thing is um, the company hasn't changed its business practices at all. In fact, if anything, its business practices have got worse, certainly from the investigation that 
we're doing of a very recent case, it would suggest that. But their PR around what they do and how they do it has increased remarkably. And where that affects them, um, which is something that I'm sure Susie would have experienced in the work that she does, is they're incredibly good at allaying the fears of investors. So of saying to them, well, you know, there was this problem and we were seen as doing this, that, and the other, but now we've addressed it in this way, da, 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 da. But the actual day-to-day -day modus operandi of their businesses barely changes at all. So, you know, there's another case. There was another piece of great strategic litigation that I'm sure Alejandro is aware of um, in Stuttgart against Heckler and Koch, the sort of German equivalent of, of Smith and Wesson, if you will, um, sometimes called the most deadly company in Europe. And they were found to have violated German arms export laws, um, a real first in, in terms of legal precedent in Germany, by exporting to certain provinces or states in Mexico. Now, what was fascinating about that case is something else that came out of it, besides those massive human rights abuses, was the fact of the way in which they lobbied the German government to effectively turn a blind eye to where the exports were going. And how they did it was that they made myriad, very small gifts to the ruling party's offices all over Germany. And they ensured that all of those gifts were under the threshold for federal prosecutors or for, for state prosecutors to investigate. Now, they had learned from the experience of Helmut Kohl, who, you know, until literally the day before he died, was protesting his innocence on charges of corruption, illicit and illicit arms deals. And clearly Angela Merkel, who has now left office and who in many respects was, was a very admirable leader, had learned from that and ensured that the party continued to receive money from these companies, but in a more legally strategic way. So I think the companies often change to actually get around loopholes. And unfortunately, the biggest example, in, in, to my mind, of the ways in which companies haven't changed their behaviors and the relationship between companies and the states hasn't changed significantly is with the conflict in Yemen. And what makes that such a unique and different conflict? Well, I would argue probably since the conflict in Vietnam, it is one of the first times where we have seen the intentional targeting and killing of innocent civilians by, in this case, predominantly the Saudi and UAE-led coalition. And the continuation of weapons being sold to those coalition forces by companies in the US, the EU, and the United Kingdom. And the companies continue to say, we are only doing what our governments tell us we can do. The governments are saying, well, you know, these are companies, they're pursuing their commercial um, interests. And yes, we, are, we have created this very rigorous environment in which they know whether to export or not. Now, some governments have even been pushed to introduce some forms of suspension of, of sales to some of the coalition partners. But the reality is that the edifice of arms export controls and the behavior of weapons producing companies is in tatters as a consequence of the ongoing conflict in Yemen, which continues to see, as we are sitting here speaking, continued violations of international humanitarian law and possible war crimes being committed by these weapons making companies and the complicity of their governments. So I think, you know, while certain things like the International Arms Trade Treaty at the UN, which Rachel and others were very involved in, it's given us as civil society mechanisms to say, but you signed up to this and you're doing that. And those mechanisms are incredibly important. But the bigger problem we have is the profound lack of political will to actually change meaningful legislation and in any way to change behavior. So the challenges before us remain huge. And I think there are a lot more things we have to do about this notion of political will and how we as civil society and ordinary citizens exert pressure on our governments to change the situation that they're currently overseeing. 
Yeah, I, yeah, Andrew, thank you very much. I, you know, I, I can't help but absolutely agree with you that, um, you know, all too often this comes down to political political will. And, you know, there, were, there was a question about, you know, what are the incentives for arms companies to act in, so, in a socially responsible manner and to pay attention to human rights? And, and you know, you point out that there just are too many loopholes out there for them at the moment. And too often when they do speak about human rights, et cetera, it's really an exercise in public relations and, and window dressing. So thank you very much. Susie, coming, coming back to you, and this is, this is a, a question that's actually been put in the question and answer and that I'm going to put to you. And, you know, I know that you, you have a lot of experience in um, following different disarmament and arms control processes and that you're familiar with the different um, arms control treaties. You know, do you, do you think that we bring about um, a change by focusing on human rights and corporate responsibility, um, especially in the context of international arms transfers and, and what Andrew talks about, you know, the atrocities being committed in Yemen? Or um, do we bring about, um, or should the focus instead be on um, further implementing human rights via um, the instruments such as the Arms Trade Treaty. Susie, I, I wonder if you'd be able to speak on this, on this matter. It's may, maybe a more, um, a more extensive question than, than what you might have been anticipating. That's a big question. It's a good one. I like it. Thank you. Um, I think it's, I, I, I don't think it can be ever a situation of one or the other, right? Um, because what, what we're looking at is we're looking at a broader societal change and to, to look to hold actors who, who think they can do things, think they can commit human rights violations, think they can slaughter civilians with impunity, we're holding them to account. That, and doing that, that accountability is a big piece of this change. That, that we are seeking um, and through so many different mechanisms. Um, so the, the human rights, the corporate responsibility is one way to get there. Um, and so, you know, I mentioned Raytheon being so excited about conflicts. Raytheon is also super excited because they have a tremendous, um, very positive campaign to promote, um, to promote the, the well-being of LGBL, of, I can never remember the whole, all the letters, <laughs> all the letters, acronyms um, it, within their own personnel, right? So, so they're, they're taking one, one step, but they're also doing horrible things on another side. Um, and we can't win every battle, every moment, every time. Um, and I think that's, that's important, but, but there is no, there is, you know, there is no creating a society of accountability, of transparency, of safety um, without addressing all of these different pieces and without using the tools that we have to hand and creating new ones when those are left lacking. And I think that's what we're hearing here. I mean, we've heard mention of some tools that have great possibility, right? So the UN Guiding Principles has great possibility. The Arms Trade Treaty has great possibility. You know, these, these lawsuits, they have great possibility if we continue to use them and apply them and build on them cumulatively. Um, and I think that's something that um, we're all trying to do. And I, I honestly, we never know what it is. What was the magic thing that changed, that created the change? Um, it could be somebody standing in the street and screaming in front of it and, and finally getting through to a CEO who's just trying to get into their car and, and, and looks up and says, oh, we, we could do something different now, couldn't we? You know, it, you, we don't know. It could be the print on the back of a wine bottle that makes somebody think about something differently. All of these things have, have possibilities. So I never want to hesitate, never want to limit um, to one strategy because we, what we're doing is we're building coalitions. We're working with each other across so many different ways and so many sectors so that we have space for these possibilities, for this change. Um, and Honestly, my dream of the, of the perfect world is not going to be the same as any of y'all's dream of a perfect world. Um, and that's also okay. 
Um, and I, I really want to encourage and, and respect the fact that um, we're, we're getting there. What we're doing with events like this and with these different tools that we have um, is we're building on possibility um, and we're building on success. And I have to say, we cannot deny that we are much better along now than we were 20 years ago before that arms trade treaty was negotiated. We're better. We have more tools. We have more possibility. Um, so let's keep doing that and not limit ourselves to one direction or another, but instead figure out what best calls to us and where we can best offer, um, offer our hope and, and opportunity. Yeah, thanks very much, um, Susie. And, you know, I think it's a good point you make that, you know, we are, we are looking at a broad societal change and we have to really use all tools at our disposal. So we're on to the third and final round of questions. We're nearly there. Um, I, I want to, you know, again go first to Alejandro and the um, Mexican government's case. And, you know, I said earlier on that, you, you know, your submission, it really does make for sober, um, sober reading. And there are, um, you know, references to cases where actors within the U.S. arms industry have um, proposed constructive action, uh, but that has not been progressed. From your perspective, what would you wish to see from states and civil society to bring about um, better engagement with and a more um, forthcoming approach from the arms industry? Um, thank you. And let me say, Susie, you, you inspire me. You gave me a lot of courage because when we started this litigation, we got a lot of voices saying, you're going to lose. Uh, I'm a litigant. I'm going to win. But what we're doing, what we're doing in the court in Boston is a small thing of what everything that is working. And I think we're already seeing some changes. What are the things that we would like to see from states and civil society? First of all, I need, I need, we need to call them out, the arms industry, saying, stop saying that you're a, perhaps you are, but prove it, a good faith industry. Stop saying that it's somebody else's fault. We want to hold you accountable. A lot of people said, like, why litigation? Did you try approaching them? And I, I'm not that naive. We had to litigate to make changes. The damages caused by the negligent practices that facilitate actively the illicit traffic of weapons amounts to almost 6% of Mexico's GDP. The damages that we're ask, asking are enormous. And perhaps the investors might be aware of this. How can we create change with the arm industry, calling them out? They are, if they want to do good business, if they want to be responsible, they want to want to contribute to the society, they want to do things better. It's not that hard. Mexico and this lawsuit is not against the arms trade. Personally, I wouldn't like to see it anymore, but if it has to happen based on domestic laws and social contracts in each country, it has to be a trade that is responsible, transparent, and accountable. And furthermore, it should be a trade that doesn't impact other societies that have different social contracts. In Mexico, as I said, we only have one office that sells guns. Why are we seeing half a million guns entering our country every year? A society, and states. And I think we're moving forward. What they brought, Secretary Brard did in the Security Council, we shouldn't forget it. He called them out saying, you need countries, instead of pointing out that they're violation of human rights, that's okay, but you need to work with your businesses. Hold them accountable, make them responsible, and stop just blah, blah, blah all the time. Let's work. There's people dying. And I think this is, Susie, you encouraged me, and now I just went ahead. But anyway, <laughs> hey, this is what I think. Alejandro, thanks very much. And, you know, you're, you're right that um, we, uh, you know, we all too often get caught up in the technicalities of interpreting and different provisions of, of the ATT, but we really have to, you know, keep at the forefront of our mind, you know, what is, um, you, you know, what is our, our key goal? And that is, uh, you know, preventing human suffering. And that really for, needs, you know, more in the way of calling out the industry. So, you know, I, co I couldn't agree with you more. Um, next, let's go to um, back to Susie. 
Um, Susie, you, you know, you've talked about, you know, that we have instruments at our disposal. And um, I think, you, you know, on this, in this discussion, you've provided a, a lot of hope. Um, you know, do you, um, you've, um, campaigning, you know, has been successfully carried out against pension funds being invested in the weapons industry. Do you, do you see other areas in the financial sector where, where change is coming about? And, you know, in, in the financing of the weapons industry, what gives you, you know, do you have, um, uh, are you hopeful and what gives you cause for hope? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm always hopeful, um, but like a, you know, like a scout, I, I hope for the best and I prepare for the worst. Um, so I really, I really am hopeful. And let me give you an example of why. Uh, this past December, it was in November and December, there was a series of articles in financial press, uh, primarily across Europe. And one in the Financial Times in particular stuck stuck in my mind. Um, and the headline was, the rise of ESG adds to pressure on European defense companies. Now, I'm looking at the way investment is moving, the, the trends, and I'm seeing 60, 70 percent of new investors saying we will only invest in companies that have a good environmental, social, and governance track record. That's where wealth is moving. And defense companies cannot, they're trying really hard, but they cannot justify their track records. They're, some are promising to go carbon neutral. They're putting out policies saying, you know, their employees have great, great access and no, no, you know, no problems internally. But what they do, the very nature of their work undermines all of that. And this article talked about the way that this sector, the defense sector, is being shunned completely making them pariahs of the investment world. To me, that is, that's super hopeful. It's, it's super exciting. And I'm seeing it in, um, invest, with investors more than pension funds. Pension funds tend to act kind of quickly. They're asset managers. They just sell their shares. They can do that. The pension receivers and the, the people who contribute to the pension, um, there's, there's a quick change possibility there. And that's amazing. But banks are doing it as well. And big banks are naming things like the arms trade treaty to require them to do more due diligence. I mean, big banks, BBVA, BNP Paribas, Danske Bank, like these are big institutions with hundreds of millions going out in loans, billions going out in loans. Um, and they're talking about the arms trade treaty in particular, that they have to be conscientious about when they're reviewing transactions and they're reviewing the companies that they will offer loans to for general corporate purposes. Um, and more and more, we're seeing exclusions around not just controversial weapons, the, the weapons themselves and product-based exclusions, but also controversial weapon practices. And that to me is just, it gives us a lot of, it's a lot of possibility. The work is not nearly done. And please do not take my hopeful demeanor as, you know, as a license to just, you know, go out for a drink and be like, hey, we're done. We fixed the world because it's not. You know, there's still a lot to do. Um, hey, hey, Susie, <laughs> just a, a question from the audience. And yeah. that is, you know, has, um, you know, have dis disarmament NGOs and other organisations considered targeted advocacy with the largest institutional investors such as BlackRock, Vanguard and State Street? Absolutely. And mm -hmm. because of that type of advocacy, they all now offer funds that exclude controversial weapons. But you have to go to them. They're not taking it as a broad top level group policy yet. So if you have funds there and there's some great campaigns, particularly in the U.S., the, um, as you so has an excellent tracker for weapons free funds. Um, take a look, get involved and, and, and help us out with it because we can't do it alone. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's that's another important piece, but it is moving. Um, and I think as we continue to build these instruments and show how not investing in the weapons sector means sustained profit as well for those whose only concern is the bottom line. Um, I think we're going to keep, we're going to keep building on these successes. Okay. That's Thanks so much, Susie. Thanks. Andrew, um, for these three rounds of questions, the last word goes to you. <laughs> um, Andrew, you know, you're, you're deep in the trenches 
and uh, you know, understandably so. But um, you know, do you, uh, is there is there something that gives you cause for hope that you know we will see um, more in the way of responsibility from the arms industry? I suppose. I mean, I should have a completely cynical view, given that I'm what Al Gore would describe as a recovering politician. Um, and that I do investigative work day to day, which sometimes can feel like knocking your head against a brick wall. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I come from a country that overcame 350 years of racist oligarchy in the system of apartheid. And I was forced to leave South Africa in the mid 80s to avoid serving in the apartheid military. And I remember the last night that I was leaving my hometown of Cape Town, I thought, well, I'll never see this country again in my lifetime. This was in 1986. In 1991, Nelson Mandela was released from prison. The ANC was unbanned. I could return to the country because my only crime had been to belong to an illegal organization. And four years after that, Mandela was president. And, you know, the ANC was the government of the country, not without challenges, which I experienced personally, but it's still an extraordinary thing. And if in 1986, when I was leaving the country, someone had said to me, don't worry, you know, in five years, it'll all be great. I would have offered them a straitjacket because there was absolutely no prospect of that. So I'm often in the work described as naive and idealistic. And I think many of us in the broad arms trade movement, and I just want to reiterate what Susie said, you know, one of the wonderful things about those who work on these sorts of issues, is that we work at it for, from so many different perspectives. And that makes the unity of the work so incredibly powerful. And I think it's an enormous strength of the movement to control the arms trade better. Um, but, you know, so sometimes we're called naive and idealistic, but if believing that the world can be better than it is today is either naive or idealistic or both, then absolutely sign me up. I'm naive and idealistic because I think anybody who lives thinking that the world can only be worse tomorrow is not really living. So I feel a great sense of hope. I also think the other comment that Susie made, that's incredibly important. None of us know what that tipping point is going to be. If we did, we wouldn't be having these conversations anymore. So we've got to keep at the work from all of the different perspectives from strategic litigation, traditional campaigning and protest, investigative work, direct action work. And at some point, that tipping point will be reached just as it was on, for instance, same-sex marriages in the US, when Obama as a candidate wouldn't even endorse the position. And two years into his presidency, you know, the majority of states were up for changing their laws. So it is incredibly difficult to predict. But what gives me specific hope as well is just seeing over the last few years, the number of young people coming to this work. We've been really fortunate to be involved in two incredible projects. One called the Arms Trade Corruption Tracker, which is run by this group of young women from all over the world. I mean, two thirds of them I've never met except on Zoom calls because we haven't been able to travel. And they have taken this idea and turned it into an incredible online resource that is tracking corruption in the arms trade on an almost weekly basis. We also have something called Demilitarize Education, which you can find primarily on Instagram, which I have to admit, I can't figure out. I can't figure out how to post a story on Instagram and they all laugh at me for it. But have a look at the work this young group are doing in promoting a world without an uncontrolled arms trade. I mean, the creativity of it, is something that I could never have imagined. The innovation that they bring to it is incredible. And I'm seeing groups like this springing up all over the world. So that gives me hope. And then I always, and I'm afraid Rachel, who she and I have spoken on many platforms together, has probably heard this more times than she would have liked to. But the other thing that always inspires me, because of all these experiences starting in South Africa, is what Margaret Mead, the American anthropologist, said near the end of her life. History is changed by the actions of small groups of committed, thoughtful citizens working together. It has always been the case, and it always will be. And when it comes to controlling the trade in weapons that has such devastating consequences on how we live and die, on the ways in which we are governed, 
on what we spend our money on and what we don't spend our money on as a consequence. It is that that gives me the most hope. We are citizens. And ultimately, we will hold our political representatives to account until there is profound change in the way the global arms trade is regulated and controlled. Uh, th th you know, thanks very much, Andrew. I think, I think you've made this, you know, a number of really important points. And, uh, you know, even um, across my lifetime, which I, I won't tell you how long that is, you know, I have seen a, a disarmament community and civil society that's really diversified in its strategies, uh, you know, um, taken on new approaches to tackling these issues. And a, a good point you make is that we, we always have to look for um, different networks and, you know, the engagement of youth, the engagement of gender, um, really ensuring that we have, a, you know, um, regional engagement, sub-regional, cross-regional engagement has been extremely important. So thank you very much. Now we'll get, we're um, coming towards the end and waiting patiently has been Rachel Stoll. And I, I want to um, now hand over to her to talk about um, her experiences of um, engaging uh, with the arms industry. So over to you, Rachel. Thanks, Hinaway, and, and thanks to our panelists. I really, it was a very uh, thoughtful discussion in that it really, I was trying to think, you know, it's hard when you're asked to do concluding remarks and you're not sure what everyone's going to say, how to sort of tie it all together. And I think, you know, the idea of engagement is really central and just picking up on the last thing that Andrew said in terms of the Margaret Mead quote, we are always stronger when we find common purpose and we work together. And so I think um, sort of the theme of what I'm going to try and wrap up here is how we better engage with all stakeholders in the ATT because the defense industry is a stakeholder that is both impacted by and has a role to play in the effective implementation of the arms trade treaty. And I am gonna try and focus my remarks really on the tool that, that Susie mentioned, this is an opportunity. The ATT presents an enormous opportunity for us to be more strategic, to think about sort of pragmatic and very practical steps that both the industry can take to be um, involved in the arms trade in a more responsible and adherent to the ATT way, but also how we as civil society and we as government can um, best engage with industry. And I think before the, the global pandemic, we had seen in the ATT context, a lot of interest in engaging industry. I personally appeared on many panels and plenary sessions talking about the role of the ATT in the defense industry. But even going you know, years prior, when I was involved in the negotiations um, and served as a consult consultant to the ATT process, I regularly met with the defense industry so that we could make sure we were not creating unintended consequences to the global, develop uh, global defense industry that we were developing buy-in from this stakeholder. And I think some of that was, um, you know, really, really practical in terms of like, how do you actually keep records for nine to 20 years? Is there a difference? Because often it's the defense industry keeping the records, not government. So what does that look like? How does that really work on a practical level? Um, so some diplomats don't necessarily understand um, the shipping and paperwork processes involved in an arms transfer. So when you're creating regulations, you need to actually understand how the system and the process work. So you, you talk to those with with practical experience. And I think that's really important that we remember that the defense industry does this on a daily basis. We as civil society, government themselves are not, you know, in the nitty gritty of what a transfer means. What does compliance mean? What does that paperwork look like? What do the processes look like? And so I want to share some of the perspectives regarding ATT implementation and interpretation that I have learned over the past, I hate to say this, like 15 years now. Um, ish working on ATT issues or ATT conceptual issues um, in the defense industry. And I think it's important to remember from the outset, and it's been mentioned, I think Andrew mentioned it really well in his remarks, that it is national governments that implement the ATT. It is national governments that make these arms transfer decisions. And industry's role is to comply with those regulations and ensure that their processes and procedures are in compliance with national laws, 
with national or international obligations. They're not parties to the treaty. They are not responsible for ATT implementation, but they have an incredible role to play in that implementation process. And I think part of um, the strategy and the messaging is thinking about how ATT implementation supports industry objectives. It does promote greater responsibility. It does promote transparency in the legitimate trade of conventional weapons, right? And the defense industry is involved in the legitimate trade of conventional weapons. So we want greater responsibility. We want greater transparency. And I think there are several motivations that industry themselves have um, expressed in terms of why they would like to see the ATT implemented effectively. The first, and I'll unpack these, I'm gonna go through them quickly and then I'll unpack them. The first is that it helps harmonize regulatory approaches. So when you have convergence amongst um, defense trade control systems around the world, it's easier for states to comply because they know what the rules are for particular transactions. Second, the ATT can help clarify and standardize obligations and responsibilities for industry around the world. Third, the ATT levels the playing field with clearly defined rules. All manufacturers are operating under a broadly similar framework. And fourth, and lastly, adherence to the ATT does reduce reputational risk. And this is to what Susie was saying, as companies are using government agreed and supported frameworks for their transfer decisions. So I just want to unpack those quickly because I think it's important to understand both the motivations for um, industry engagement and involvement in the ATT, but also how we can leverage that interest and engagement to promote a more responsible and transparent arms trade. So in terms of harmonizing regulatory controls, there are two significant benefits to the defense industry. First, it makes it easier for them to comply with the various national systems that may apply to a, um, a given transaction. And second, it helps clarify the obligations of industry vis-a-vis -vis the state and thereby allows defense industries and governments around the world to support and validate global supply chain growth. So you know what the rules are, you know what the processes are, there aren't sort of, you know, we avoid some of the corruption and skirting of, of laws and rules that fit maybe with one country's but not uh, systems and not with the other. The defense industry is not national in nature. It relies on a global supply chain to manufacture, develop, and transfer its goods. But the different regulations in each country makes it very difficult, very expensive for industry to conduct its business. And I think if you had international standards, you would not require any government to reduce its desired level of control. And in fact, it would sort of raise um, the standards globally as countries don't look to find countries with less restrictive, companies don't look to refine countries with less restrictive um, environments. Uh, second, the ATT, I think really it's, sorry, even though there are national, uh, there's national implementation, there are some standards that are very clear and global in nature, and it clarifies those obligations and responsibilities of industry and a lot around the world. Um, I think that when you have when industry knows what is expected, they can determine how to best comply. And industry has uh, very extensive compliance officers and compliance teams and compliance checks to make, we may not like the state decision to transfer, right? Like that's, a, that's the second piece, but in terms of here are the rules and here's how to comply, um, you know, that is a, a big focus of, of industry. Third, in terms of leveling the playing field, um, there, the defense industry generally seeks to achieve international sales through cooperative arrangements that are supported by governments that are seeking bilateral um, defense relationships that are consistent with regional and international stability. So it's not in the interest of national security um, of countries or responsible exporters to see other exporters through irresponsible transfers promote instability and disrupt long-term relationships. So major defense companies really tend to accept that the export opportunities have to be guided by the current international security framework. So when you have a, West, a less well-regulated supplier that enters a problematic market or transfers advanced technology, as, as Susie was talking about, to such markets, it causes regional instability, adversely affects industry, 
that tends to comply with international frameworks. So when we have a clearly defined um, rule, all exporters are operating under broadly similar framework. And I lastly just want to end about um, reputational risk, because we talked a lot about sort of moral obligation. And I think reputational risk, not just for Coca-Cola, but for all businesses is really a driver about deciding what business opportunities you enter into. And many companies, um, and we mentioned the UK case, particularly um, find themselves subject to outside scrutiny, uh, particularly to investors to examine risk and corporate responsibility. And this is all, all about responsible trade, whether it's the trade in beverages or bananas or teddy bears or, or weapons. And I think there's a lot of um, external criticism that we're seeing, whether it's on the front page of the paper or in conversations like this, where people are questioning um, companies' responsibilities. And I think the ATT provides a framework that um, is based on moral arguments of human security, social and economic development, international peace and se security, and all of those are compatible with good business practice. So under the ATT, governments have clearly delineated criteria about whether they should allow an arms sale to go forward. And I think if we, in some ways, um, having a strongly implemented ATT protects the defense industry, gives them answers to their investors because they say, this is the rules, this is what we have to follow, we're not pursuing these transfers or we can pursue these transfers. Um, and I think it's a really, uh, a really important role. I also just, I should mention something about transparency because I think Susie mentioned that at the outset of her um, remarks. Sorry, I know it's a little bit all over the place. I'm trying to make sure I pull on all the threads that you all mentioned in your very thoughtful comments. Um, but I do want to say in terms of transparency, um, obviously governments are the ones that report to the ATT. But depending on national systems, industry may actually keep those records and have that information to give to the, to the government to be able to report um, to industry. So I think there is a role for industry to play in supporting transparency. Obviously, industry doesn't want to create additional reporting obligations or corporate burdens for themselves, but I think they can work with states to understand why information is required and requested um, and to provide that information so we can have a more comprehensive and transparent arms trade. So all I'll close there, except to say, I think this conversation really has demonstrated that global commerce, whatever kind of commerce that is, really benefits from equal treatment, clearly understood rules of the game, accountability when there are violations um, of those rules, and defense industry certainly is no exception. And I would just continue to argue that industry involvement and engagement in the ATT process I think will ensure that the ATT has a better chance of comprehensive and effective implementation. Hey, Rachel, thanks very much. And, you know, thanks very much for reminding us all about the, poss the possibilities that the Arms Trade Treaty um, provides. And it's really up to, to all actors and especially governments and their role in ensuring robust regulation um, of the arms industry. So now it's um, left to me to um, thank all of you. Thanks very much, Susie, Andrew, Alejandro, and Rachel for um, sharing your time and your expertise with us. This has been a, a, an excellent discussion and I've learned a lot and I hope that those who have um, listened in have, have also, uh, you know, also take something away um, from this discussion. There have also been some excellent questions. Um, I want to say, you know, um, I, I wish all of us good luck in this endeavour. It, it, it is an enormous one, but especially good luck to Alejandro with that, with the legal case going forward. You know, we will be watching it closely and certainly whatever the outcome, you know, you, you have many admirers um, who will be cheering you along. So, so best of luck. 
you know, thanks very much to everybody for attending and a special thanks to my colleague, Matthew Steedman, who despite not feeling very well, has been providing the technical assistance and questions to me. So thanks very much, Matthew. So once again, thanks, thanks to everybody for um, listening in on this conversation. And I, you know, I really look forward to, to continuing this discussion again. Thank you. Bye-bye.